Let me be maybe the fifth person to say good morning to you today and welcome you to CCF. If we haven't met yet, my name is Janelle and I have the joy of serving as one of your pastors here at Cougamonga Christian Fellowship, which we affectionately call what? CCF, CCF, in case you're new and you're like, what is this CCF that they're talking about? This is strange. Can you believe it's November? No, no, I will not tell you how many days until Christmas because that might send us all into anxiety, which is good because we can sign up and manage that. Um, But I will admit that I am seriously considering putting up my Christmas tree this afternoon. Is it too soon? Oh, there are some strong feelings there. (laughs) I don't know if I'll listen or not. Well, stay tuned. Um, Christmas trees have nothing to do with the message today. That's just a fun little side note that we're in, which is the next installment on our series of commission that should sound familiar to many of you. As we continue to look at what it means to be followers of Jesus and to live out that call to love God, to love people, and to what? Make disciples. You know this well. And if you're faith in general, we believe that there is one true God who exists eternally and equally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that the Bible is inerrant truth, Old Testament and New Testament, and it still has relevance to our lives today. It is the guidebook that God has given us to live a holy life. We believe that sin is real and that it is anything that separates us from God who is holy, and that holiness, not sin, was the original plan and design for our lives. We were designed for love, for wholeness, for peace, for relationship, and none of this is something that we can achieve on our own. So God sent His Son Jesus to earth, into this world, to defeat the power of sin and death in our lives. We believe that Jesus did just that. He died on a cross, He was buried in a tomb, and He rose again miraculously, and now He resides in heaven until He returns. For now, though, He has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, and He extends an invitation of forgiveness and redemption and new and eternal life to all. Everyone say, to all. Longing that all would be saved. 2,000 years ago, Jesus concluded His time here on earth, surrounded by the men and women who were known as His disciples, and He shared these words for them from Matthew 28 and to us today, saying, "'All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age.'" During the month of September, as our commission series began, we looked at this priority of loving God and four distinct ways that we could do that. Do you remember what they are? God's presence, God's Word, prayer, worship. Does that sound familiar to you? And then in October, we shifted our focus to the priority of loving people. We talked about what? Do you remember? We talked about relationship, righteousness, unity, And last week we talked about that priority of honour. Now in the final month of this series, our focus shifts for one last time to the importance of making disciples. Everyone say, it's time to make disciples. Very good. Now too often as followers of Jesus and as church communities in general, we get really good at those first two, don't we? Really good at attempting to love God and to love people. But then we kind of, take a step back when it reaches that last one. Because when it comes to making disciples, we're often educated beyond our own experience. We're often informed beyond how we're willing to continue being transformed. Or we disqualify ourselves and tell ourselves we're not capable, we're not called, or maybe we're not committed to this goal of making disciples. Because as A.W. Tozer says, only a disciple can make a disciple which means discipleship starts with us, with recognising there's still more for us to learn and grow in and understand about who God is and what He's doing in our lives to then multiply into somebody else. And the future of the church and our church rests on us getting the hang of this, of moving outside of our comfort zones and catching that sense of urgency regarding our own discipleship and also that of the people who don't yet know that there is a God who loves them. 
How many of you know people in your world who are caught up in the plans of the enemy to steal from their life, to kill their hopes and dreams, to destroy their future, but Jesus came so that we would have life and life abundantly. And that's the kind of life that we believe in, not just for ourselves, but for other people too. So our hope over these next four weeks is that by looking at what it means to make disciples, you will feel re-energised, re-engaged, re-inspired, and totally equipped to do this thing. Does that sound good? Yes. Yes. With all that said, the value we are exploring today is discipleship, who knew? (laughs) And our priority statement is that discipleship is our pathway. If you've got your notes, it'll be on there. Discipleship is our pathway. And a lot of images might come to mind for you when you think of the word pathway. How many of you are beach people and you just think of that trail that goes beside the ocean, maybe people run on it. Or if you're forest people, that path that you hike through, through the trees. Maybe there's a path that you typically take in your neighbourhood or like me, you are dreaming of Yosemite Valley and that meadow path 203 days from now with no computer, no phone, no worries, hopefully no people, (laughs) not that I'm counting. But no matter what comes to mind when you think of the word pathway, you know it implies regular use, doesn't it? There's a wear and tear to it. If you don't believe me, think about that patch of carpet in your house that everybody walks on. That is a pathway. But another pathway comes to mind when I think about how we tend to get lost in this discipleship piece, and perhaps you might know it too. Who remembers the movie Alice in Wonderland? Yes, I won't do a spoiler alert. It's been out since 1951. Where have you been if you have not seen it yet? (laughs) But in her ongoing quest to get home, Alice finds herself in a forest, running through the woods, following this pathway, and then all of a sudden, a very strange dog appears. I'm sure we have a picture. Brush dog that sweeps away the pathway in front of her and then runs around the back and sweeps away the path behind her. And then suddenly she finds herself standing on one small patch with no idea where to go. Do you remember this scene? Whether your path to becoming like Jesus is well worn or meandering beside a beach or you feel like you are standing in a forest and have no idea where to go, I know with great certainty that God has something encouraging for you today as we spend time in His Word, because that's who our God is. So if you have your Bibles, pull them out and turn to Luke chapter 19. We have Bibles under the seats if you didn't bring your own and you wanna use one of those. And if you don't have a Bible at home or in your car or in your purse or anywhere, please talk to one of our team today and we will send you home with one because it is important that you follow God's Word as your guide. But Luke chapter 19. So if you were here last week, we talked about the priority of honour and as a way to honour God's Word, we're gonna stand to our feet if you are able this morning as we read together, starting in verse chapter one. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Stay standing for a moment and let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word that you've given us to guide us on the journey of life. We thank you for your spirit that you've given to reside within us and to make us holy like you are holy. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who you sent to earth to pave the pathway back into your presence for us. And God, in this moment, we turn our heart and our attention to what you wanna do, to what you wanna say. Let your words, let your will, let your way be glorified in this house, in this place, in our lives. We submit to you, God, all the plans that we have for our own lives the plans that we might have for this church, for this community. And we ask instead that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here in CCF, here in our own hearts and our own lives, as you have 
designed it to be done in heaven. So we give you this time. We thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Everyone says amen, amen. You're welcome to take a seat. And as you do, tell somebody whether you find Alice in Wonderland wonderful or slightly creepy. (laughs) You're all being very honest. There are several quotes that I came across in preparing this message and they, dis- they reminded me a lot of discipleship. And I wonder if you can guess who the character is that says them. If and when you know, stick your hand on your nose so that I know that you know. First one, every adventure requires a first step. Second one, only a few find the way, some don't recognise it when they do, some don't ever want to know. Number three, I can't know everything. My sons are in the room. This is a quote, this is not me. I can and will know everything, do not test me on that. (laughs) Number four, maybe this applies too. I'm not crazy, my reality is just different than yours. Number five, if you don't have it yet, it'll be on the screen. If you don't know where you want to go, then it doesn't matter which path you take. Even if you are a cat person, I pray for you. I think we can all agree that the Cheshire cat is a little strange, right? And proof that things stranger than richer tax collectors can be found in trees. But the story of Zacchaeus gives us such a beautiful example of discipleship. Zacchaeus had heard of Jesus and he went looking for him. He encountered Jesus and he experienced life transformation from this encounter. And then his life became an example to the people around him of what God's love can do. Discipleship is the process of sanctification. It's recognising that there is movement that should be happening in our lives beyond our first encounter with Jesus. And that movement is the work of the Holy Spirit within us to make us holy like God is holy, to empower us to display that holiness to the world through, his, through our fruits, through our gifts, through our love, through His truth at work in our lives. Zacchaeus climbed a tree to remove himself from what was and to set his eyes on what could be. And as disciples of Jesus and followers of Jesus, over these next few weeks, we're setting our eyes and our sights on more than just what could be, but on what should be happening. So how do we do this thing called discipleship? Together this morning, we're gonna look at three specific ways and how those ways connect to something that we call the discipleship path here at CCF. Because we are all in different places on our journey of faith, aren't we? And sometimes knowing where to go next or what to do next can feel complicated and can feel confusing. And maybe that's part of the hang up when it comes to this thing called making disciples. But this pathway serves as a framework for you to know where you are, where you are going next, and how to invite people to join you on that journey. And it's important to know that this pathway, it's not linear. It's not a straight line. There is no official end to it until Jesus returns. It circles back upon itself again and again, which doesn't mean you're losing. It actually means you're winning at it. But the starting place for all of us and point number one for today is to be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. Here at CCF, this is always the first step and anchor point on our discipleship pathway because it focuses on the ways that you might discover God's love for you. Zacchaeus had heard of Jesus. He was in the same vicinity as Jesus, but it was the invitation to be with Jesus that began the process of transformation in his life. An invitation that he could say yes or no to because of free will, right? And here in this story, we see exactly what God has done for us because all the biblical scholars agree that Jesus went through Jericho specifically to meet Zacchaeus. The Greek words used in this passage suggest that it wasn't just a route from point A to point B, but it was a specific part of his mission of salvation and redemption for the people of Israel, which included this man who was despised by his community. It included this man who was serving as a puppet for the enemy, for the Romans. It included this man who was stealing from the poor and giving to the rich. This man who was by all accounts a sinner. And yet Jesus walking along in Jericho comes to the place where Zacchaeus is waiting in a tree and he looks up at him and he calls him by his name. Because beloved, God knows your name. 
God knows your name, which is a good thing. For some of us in the room, we might have to reframe this moment in our story because sometimes people knowing our name or saying our name is kind of scary. Like you think, oh no, I'm in trouble. My favourite memory with Pastor Melanie was when her Alexa wasn't listening to her and she got this mum voice on and went, Alexa, turn the music down. (laughs) Our names can be powerful, right? With the tone and the phrasing, but God knows our name in the most beautiful and intimate way. God knows your name. You might feel despised by the people around you. You might feel a puppet to things that are beyond your control right now. But God knows you and He sees you and He loves you and He is at work within you and work within your story and the story of what's happening around you to bring about His goodness. That's the kind of way that He knows your name. You might be afraid maybe of what God sees or thinks when He looks at you, but God says in Isaiah 43, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Before you were born, God knew you and knit you together in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And woven through the story of your life are moments where God invited you to be with Him just as you are. He sent His Son Jesus to earth to be crucified on a tree so that we wouldn't have to climb trees in order to find Him. Discipleship begins with discovering God's love for us and these first steps forward on that journey happen when we understand and we believe with our whole hearts that God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but would have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through Him. And it's His love that compels us to grow deeper and wider and higher and longer in reflecting who Jesus is. It's His love that moves us along in that process of sanctification, of being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit to be the version of ourselves that God sees when He looks at us. We don't belong in a tree. And praise God, our sin didn't require us to be crucified on one either. But living on this pathway of discipleship calls us not to forget the tree of Calvary and what happened there. In Matthew 16, 24 and Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. I'll read it again because we don't like to remember that verse, right? If we wanna be his disciple, we must deny ourselves daily, every day, take up our cross and follow Him. Wherever God's love finds you, it doesn't leave you there. He loves us too much to leave us in our sin or our mess or our selfishness. Instead, He makes known to us the path of life where we can find joy and His presence, even in suffering, even in chaos, even in anxiety. Choosing to follow that path is discipleship. To be with Jesus on a daily basis means that we spend time in His Word. We spend time in prayer and worship. We build fasting into our rhythms of life and we stay committed to being in community with God's people. Something as simple as being in church right now on Sunday on a weekly basis might feel routine for you. It might feel optional, but it's actually bigger than that. It's part of your discipleship journey. It's part of discovering what we've been called to. In her book, Inspired, Rachel Held Evans says, the church is not a group of people who believe all the same things. The church is a group of people caught up in the same story with Jesus at the center. The invitation that Jesus gives to us is the same that he gave to his 12 disciples. And it's the same that he gave to Zacchaeus. Will you prioritize being with me? The more time we spend discovering God's love for us, the more empowered we are to then share that love with others, which brings us to the second point this morning, which is to become like Jesus. Become like Jesus. Here at CCF, this is the second step on the discipleship pathway, and it focuses on the ways that you might deepen your love for others. Zacchaeus responded to Jesus' invitation with joy, and not just any kind of joy, but the same kind of joy we heard about a few weeks ago when we heard the story of the lost coin and the lost sheep and the prodigal son. Zacchaeus was living out our main idea for unity and choosing to join the party. And here again, just like with the older brother in Luke 15, we find people grumbling about who was invited to the party of salvation. 
But isn't it just like Jesus to shake up their routines and widen their community to include the person who had wronged them? Because love means doing the best for someone else no matter the cost. In fact, the greater the cost, the greater the love. The call to love was the same for both Zacchaeus and those around him, but we see that Zacchaeus is the one who is moved to act upon that love, promising to give half his possessions to the poor and then to right the wrongs that he may have done. He committed to a present action and a future behaviour. God might be calling us to both of those things today. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, the person who's in love with their vision of community will destroy community. But the person who loves the people around them will create community wherever they go. Let that sink in for a minute because we want to be people who build community, don't we? We want to be people who share the love and the invitation of love, not critique it. The reality of God's kingdom is that we've been given so that we can give. We've been included so we can include. We've been loved so that we can love. We've been discipled so we can disciple. In John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus gave us this command to love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you what? If you love one another. Without fail, how God treats us should move us to treat the people around us in new and transformed ways. In ways that are generous with our time and our treasure and our talent and even our testimony. You've heard us talk about it a lot. To become like Jesus in the way that we love means that we don't hoard His goodness for ourselves, but we share it and go out of our way to invest that goodness into others. So where might your Jericho be? Who might your Zacchaeus be? During our commission group a couple of weeks ago, someone in the group shared about how she's choosing to be intentional with where and when she gets her coffee. By going to the same place at the same time, She's meeting the same people and investing into those people. Would driving through Starbucks be more convenient? Probably. But there's nothing like sacrificial love to make a difference in someone else's life. And yes, where you get your coffee can become an act of sacrificial love. And the sacrifice of love that Jesus gave for us is what we are called to display to the world, which leads to our third point for this morning. Point number three is to be evidence of Jesus. Be evidence of Jesus. This is the third step on the discipleship pathway here at CCF. And it focuses on the ways that you might display His love to the world. So Zacchaeus meets Jesus, he's welcomed into his home and he's immediately confronted with how his life must change. And he commits to that change which is all miraculous, but then the most miraculous thing happens because one who was lost was now found. One who was broken was now being made whole. One who had caused harm was now committed to helping to cause healing. So how about us? What do people see in us? How do people experience us? As your staff and your board here at CCF, we've talked a lot about this month of November and the focus on making disciples. Because like Pastor Cam shared earlier, God has done amazing things over the last 40 years of this church. We celebrated it last week and we are so grateful to be standing on the love and the sacrifice and the intentionality of the men and the women who have gone before us. People who have sat in these seats that you are sitting in right now in this room, who wholeheartedly believed in what was ahead for this church. And it's our turn to make it happen. God's strategy for reaching the world with His love hasn't changed. It's you and it's me and it's His church. It's the people who choose to be with Jesus because the more we are with Him, the more we become like Him. And becoming like Jesus, it should make the people around you a little uncomfortable. Not because you're crazy, but because your reality is now different to the reality of those that you live in the world with. We are evidence of Jesus when we see someone who clearly needs a miracle in their life. And we go and we pray for that miracle to occur. We're evidence of Jesus when we show up in this church community with wholehearted commitment to seeing this place grow and flourish and make a difference in the world around us and not fold on our watch. We're evidence of Jesus when we go out of our way every day to encounter someone that we might share the good news of the gospel with. 
because we are so wealthy, just like Zacchaeus, but are we willing to become poor like he was to make right some of the things that we might be getting wrong? We wake up each and every day with the gift of life, with the resource of time and finances, with incredible ways that God has uniquely designed and created each and every one of us to make a difference in this world. And you might be sitting here thinking, but making disciples is for the professionals. You're right, it is, absolutely. In Mark 16, Jesus says to his followers, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Who believes here today? Who believes in Jesus? Give me a wave. All right, here you go. You, in his name, will drive out demons. You will speak in new tongues. You will pick up snakes with your hands. I don't recommend it. You will drink deadly poison, don't recommend that either, but it will not hurt you because we serve a miraculous God. You will place your hands on sick people and they will become well. Guess what? If you believe in Jesus and have been baptised, you are a professional, congratulations. Add it to your resume this week. Turn to someone around you and say, I am a professional at what God has called me to do. Turn to someone else and say, he's given me everything I need. (laughs) Now point to yourself and say, let's get to work. (laughs) There are so many action points that I could give you today, but instead we've listed an example of the discipleship pathway on the back of your sermon notes. And I want you to pick one thing from each category to do this week. And these aren't difficult things. You could actually knock out all three before you leave this room if you wanted to. And that includes being baptised this morning. Because as we close today, and as the worship team come and join me again, that is exactly what we are gonna do. We are excited to give time and space to baptism. We read earlier in Matthew 28 and Mark 16 that being baptised is part of our discipleship journey. And I don't know where you might be on your faith journey today. Perhaps you've recently come to know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour and you're wondering, what is the next step that I should take? Baptism is a beautiful piece of that. Or maybe you've known Jesus for quite some time and you're looking for that next thing to do, to display to the world around you what is happening within you because of His love. Baptism is a great option for you. Maybe you've walked with Jesus and you've been a little distant. You've been a little far away. You haven't been listening. You haven't been following. And you want to take a stand in this moment today and say, no, I'm coming back to what God is doing in my life. I'm believing that He can make me whole. He can make me new. Baptism isn't what saves you or sets you free, but it's one of the sacraments, just like communion, given to us as a way to live out our salvation and our freedom. It's a moment to celebrate that we were once lost and now we are found. We were once broken and now we are whole. It displays to the world around us the evidence of Jesus at work in our life. Today, we're really excited to celebrate with our friend Corey as he gets baptised. But if you are here this morning, yeah, you can celebrate him. And I'll have Pastor Cam and Corey and Pastor Mel start to get ready. But if you're here this morning and getting baptised is a decision you'd like to make, We would love to get you in the water today. We have extra t-shirts, extra towels, extra shorts, anything that you need. We will be able to bring around you and get you into the water so that you too can be part of this act of discipleship. Let me pray for you. God, thank you that you don't leave us alone. That following your ways doesn't have to be confusing. Thank you that you've given us a pathway, a guide to our life through your word, through your example, Jesus, through the nudging of the Holy Spirit within us. So in all the ways, God, that you are calling us to step up and step out in this call of making disciples, today, God, let it begin with us. We choose to stand firmly in that discipleship pathway and take those steps forward that you're calling to, believing that as we do so, you will bring alongside the people that we are called to make disciples out of. Because it's not about following us, God, it's about following you and you are worth following. 
So we thank You for Your grace in the moments that we get it wrong. We thank You that You celebrate it with us in the moments that we get it right. We thank You for the names and the faces of the people that You already know are gonna be part of this community in the days and weeks and years ahead. God, we thank You for 40 more years. We declare that into being. We submit to You, to Your will, to Your ways. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Amen.